I'm Brett, and I'm joined as usual by or Travers. Travers, there we go. Sorry, man. Yeah. I'm all like discombobulated today. Today, I was trying to change the. I was doing to uh, multitasking is never a good idea. So I was oh, trying yeah. to change the category in Twitch. I was trying to get my cheat sheet up, and yeah. Yep. It worked out really well, as you can tell. I did not change the category. I could not figure out how to do it. It's like uh, stress. I was under pressure to try to figure it out. All right, perfect. Well, with all the uh, shenanigans out of the way, let's jump in. Um, first update is around Q. So we now have inline mm. completions in the command line. So. Okay this it doesn't support everything if i understand this right like you can do at git commands and things like that it'll kind of auto populate right. it um yeah i just i i kind of threw this in here because i use this all the time and i kind of always thought it had auto completion um because i know in when i've CLI. got yeah in the cli when i've got the the mm. qcli running like it auto populates or auto completes my git commands and stuff like that. So this one took me a little bit by surprise, but I maybe I'm misunderstanding this one. I don't know. Maybe. I yeah, yeah it seems pretty smart. Yeah, if you type git, a developer might suggest a push origin main. Okay. So yeah. it's just suggestions in your CLI. Yeah, and it's okay. kind of neat, right? Like you can see in the second paragraph here, it says it looks at your current shell context, looks at your shell history to kind of try to figure out maybe what you're intending hmm. for that to be. I, I don't know. Sometimes I'm a little confused on this because I know, remember this used to be called Code Whisperer, right? So originally yes. it was Code Whisperer CLI. Before that, uh, Code Whisperer CLI, my understanding is actually came from a different company. It used to be called Fig. And it was like right. a little, remember that? And yep. I was a huge, still am a huge fan of Fig. So I don't know, maybe, maybe is it Fig in the background? Like maybe I didn't. I wouldn't be surprised. Uninstall something properly. So that's why I'm just kind of, <laughs> but it already does this. I, I don't know. Um, oh, like on your personal. Yeah, like, like on my like, yeah, personal. Maybe. Is it still running somehow? And I don't realize that I'm now running Fig and Amazon QCLI, I have no idea. Maybe they finally integrated that feature with uh Code Yeah, Whisper. I no Did longer have a feature? fig icon anywhere because I was okay. looking today before the, the the podcast, but now I'm confusing myself as we talk about this. You know, one thing yeah. I stumbled across though in the, I, I can never remember the names now because they keep changing them. Uh, Amazon QCLI, you've got a chat option right in your CLI now. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I didn't know up, you could do that. Is it just uh, puts you into like a kind of interactive prompt situation? You got yeah. it. So like you type Q login and it gives you a prompt and it says, okay, how do you want to log in? You can do mm -hmm. uh, use your builder ID, which is the most confusing thing that I think I've ever seen, <laughs> but that's for another podcast. So you've got builder right. ID. And in our case, we we pay for it. So I, I go mm -hmm. down to identity center or whatever, logs me in. And once I'm logged in, I can type Q chat and it gives me a little chat window and I can say, could you help me figure out X or Y or whatever? And it it's just oh, right sure. in your CLI, um, which I stumbled across this week. I don't even know how I managed to stumble across it. So that's kind of why I put this one in here to um, just highlight sort of the, some of the features and functionality. This is pretty cool. And to be honest, the 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 info I was getting back when I was running the little yeah. QCLI or QChat commands was was pretty good. So no, that's good. Yeah. Well, you know, pending any phantom CLI tools you may have running in the background, <laughs> maybe now autocorrect yeah. on yeah. or uh, suggest on Q. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed okay. You know, the other thing that I kind of grumpy about, not grumpy about, but that they need to figure out somehow is if I'm in my IDE and again, maybe this mm -hmm. is, it's probably user error. When I'm in my IDE, Amazon Q, I've logged out there. I'm, yeah. I'm like it auto times out. Right. So I've got to re-authenticate, but then I'm, as far as I can tell, I've authenticated in Amazon Q CLI, but they're two separate things. Mm -hmm. So then I got to keep authenticating all over the place. Um, I don't know, you know, multiple tokens multiple sessions it looks like yeah yeah it must be must be going on something like that so anyways i would suggest that you try this i think that amazon q 
the the CLI portion, my memory is that it's not supported on Windows yet. I think it's like a mm. Linux and Mac thing Mac only. only. Yeah, but you could always check and see if you're interested in trying it out. I, I like it. I, I've used it uh, once I discovered the the Q chat thing. I've been using it this week uh, quite a lot, actually, and just to try to test it out. And um, yeah, I've, I've, I've thought it's been pretty adequate, at least sure. pointing yeah, me in the right direction, right? Right. Yeah. 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 If you're working in the CLI all the time, it's good for that context. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, what what else do we have? Um, here's another one that kind of caught me by surprise. You can now uh, uh, increase your integration timeout limits on the API gateway beyond 29 seconds. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because hmm. um, that used to be a hard limit. You couldn't have any yeah. tasks running beyond that. You'd have to fire off an API call to kind of kick off a process and then send a response that, hey, the process has been kicked off or yeah. we've added this to your your database or whatnot but you couldn't just kind of wait for a response for that long yeah <laughs> so it's interesting yeah you know what um i i guess that's okay i i the only the you know the only thing that kind of surprised me about this or not surprised me i'm like oh great so now we're gonna have uh it'll be like i could write an api to make a call out to a service and it could just mm. instead of being a nice efficient call I could go past yeah. 30 seconds now. So do I, right. have, do I care if it's five minutes or 15 seconds? There's no handholding for kind of practices <laughs> yeah. anymore yeah. of that. Yeah. I wonder if there's like a web socket situation where that's useful. I don't know. I just maybe. have to look into that, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, maybe. For me, it's kind of a little bit of incentive to try to make it more efficient. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, but you'll notice here, I I'll highlight this. When you think about it this way, it does actually maybe make a lot of sense to do this. So you can see mm. customers requiring longer timeouts, like Gen oh, AI sure. use cases and stuff like that, right? Then you can now yeah. put the API gateway in front of it, which you couldn't before. So, oh, yeah, and they call out WebSockets in the next paragraph, actually. So that's probably the main the main use case for that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Uh, just kind of kind of thought I'd throw it in there. Uh, health imaging. Uh, whenever I see event-driven programming stuff, mm -hmm. I'm immediately like, ooh, what is that? Let's go look. Um, <laughs> not that we use health imaging for anything or, or uh, even talk yeah, to a customer about it, right? But It's a, kind of amazing. Like, there's services out there still that we haven't heard of, but I've never yeah. heard of health imaging before. What is What does that service even do? You, is it specifically for x-rays or... Store, analyze, and share medical images in the cloud at petabyte so for scale. for x-rays and yeah. MRIs. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Who knew, right? Uh, it's kind of, I've always described, ever since I started working in AWS, I've always described uh, the number of services as a little bit of a double-edged sword. It's fantastic right. that you can go out and do like all these great <laughs> things, but it's also challenging because you're like, what is this? I have no idea. So... Yeah, I think it's kind of, it makes a lot of sense. Again, I guess if we think about asynchronous and asynchronous processing, building mm. sort of event-driven applications, now maybe something happens in health imaging, you you publish an event to EventBridge and you can kind of kick off another workflow or something like that, depending sure. on what you're doing. So kind of neat. Yeah, you like upload a batch of images and then pipe it off to some sort of processing pipeline or some sort of, uh, yeah, something that'll scan the images maybe and yeah. gives you data on them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it kind of reminded me, remember, uh, it was a while ago, we worked with that customer on a, on a very small POC where we were oh, sure. uh, using Textract at the time to chew through applications, right? And pull information yeah. out and stuff and sort of this whole, whole idea of PDF processing, pushing them off into a queue or an event or something yeah. like that. Uh, kind of when I saw this, it kind of reminded me of that uh, POC that we did a few years back. Oh, yeah. Kind of neat. neat. Oh, now I've got medical imaging. Let's try this. <laughs> and uh, here's a good one. This one um, was interesting to me because uh, Titan, Text Titan or Titan Text is the, uh, I think it's a relatively newer model, if I remember, that's been made available on Bedrock. Yeah. And now you can also use it as part of your knowledge base. Because I know when we were mm -hmm. doing, I was doing out that little or or doing the let's build session on uh using CloudFormation to build out custom knowledge bases and stuff. One of the things right. that I learned there was that you've got, 
I'm going to mess up the terminology here, but you've got, I think it's called an in, embedding vector or something like that. So basically yep. what you do is you, you, you had a smaller number of models that you could use as your embedding vector, I guess, to, mm. to, to put the data into the database or something like that. I don't yeah. quite understand exactly what it was for, but then you could use again, supported models on the other side to, to actually start communicating and, with your, yeah, your bedrock knowledge base. So this is just extending it, that, I guess. Yeah, it's for reg specifically. It's how you pull data out of the databases to use vectors. Although they did say that you could use uh, natural language recently. I know we covered that yeah. in uh, one of the other episodes. Yeah. So I just thought I'd add this one. I might actually try this out because I've got the CloudFormation yeah. templates to build all this stuff. And I think I did the old, the good old um, parameter with allowed values. So you could just... okay. Either if you're in the console, just select the drop down and click it. Or if you're doing it programmatically, you could just say, this is the model I want oh, to sure. use. So I put it on my to-do list uh, to go back and have a look and just make sure I understand this one. And could I update the templates to include another model? Yeah, worth trying. Yeah, worth trying, right? And then um, I wanted to so try this before the, <laughs> the call today. And I got distracted doing a bunch of things. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I spend a fair amount of my time reading logs still. So as much yep. as things change, things don't change. So yep. um, <laughs> anytime like I'm cool. like, ooh, live tailing logs, this is cool. Uh, so I wanted to give it a whirl, um, but I thought this was kind of kind of neat. You can use it through the management console. You can use it programmatically. Uh, it even says here that you can uh, build these live streams right into your own custom dashboards, or maybe if you're building something okay. outside of AWS. So kind of kind of neat. And I would suspect if you're troubleshooting things, uh, this would be handy, right? To just do a live table oh, yeah. if, if you're starting to run something and you want to see what's happening. I actually have been using this for a oh, customer have you? writing that uh, DynamoDB upload script um, uh, for their processing their documents. So Okay, so yeah, tell me useful. about it then. How, how are you using it? So you can, you basically, you plug into the log group, right? Yep. And you're, it's essentially a tail. It, it shows you okay. the output. So I've been using it for Lambda function. Um, so it, it writes logs to CloudWatch, and then you can see that as it comes up. So it's processing okay. quite a few items in a CSV, essentially, right? So Yeah, nice. So you can sit there and basically just stream the logs as you're troubleshooting or trying to figure out if it's doing what you would expect it to do. Is that how you're using yep. it right now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, very neat. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised since it's got uh, both CLI and programmatic support that people very mm. quickly will uh, write some applications to look for specific things in LiveTail and jam them in somewhere else. Oh yeah, right. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So that's that one. And and it, you know, speaking of wanting to try something before the podcast and not having an opportunity to do it i made myself <laughs> yeah. a little note in the cheat sheet remember i think it was last week we talked about the new feature in cloud formation where uh, when you have a a stack deploy or a stack update that fails you can oh, see root yep. cause and now they have integration into Directly cloud trail, cloud trail yeah. Right? yeah yeah so i tried it a couple times last week because uh, like reading logs, I spend a, my, a lot of my time trying to figure out why a CloudFormation template <laughs> isn't working. And to be honest, helpful? nah. 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 <laughs> it's you kind of figure you know what what uh, API call is failing, right? It's the yeah. this resource didn't create. Yeah, like, you know, I was, I was working on a, a WAF implementation. That's what I was doing. So I was building out okay. some custom rules for a WAF implementation. And it failed. And it gave me the the classic old CloudFormation error message. It was like, yeah, this didn't work. I'm like, geez, thanks. So I was like, <laughs> wait, I will use this new integration. So first thing, oh, yeah. first thing, I'm like, detect root cause, which is the silliest thing ever because I could just scroll through and see where it says error. And it's going to be the first error in the list that's root cause, right? right? But anyways, I click the root, the detect root cause, and it goes down for me and finds the line. And then it's got a little link that you can click to go to CloudTrail. And okay, first thing, CloudTrail is not real time. So right. you click it and it's like, man, hang on a second. I, I don't know yet. 
try again later. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, wait I'll, five minutes. Yeah, I'll long wait. Long I'll go long. grab a coffee or whatever and come back and mm. I just want to see what this does. It yeah. is actually really interesting in the fact that I clicked the button. Once the logs were available in CloudTrail, I clicked the button and it gave me a nice little summary view of all the API calls that had been made. Okay. Okay. The problem is that mm. the error that I had, and you know, I, I, I did something stupid. I, I went back and I was troubleshooting and I figured it out and I you know, used my favorite uh, Gen AI assistant to kind of help me logic it out and point me in a direction at least, which was actually really good. But mm. I didn't take great notes. So today ah. I'm like, okay, let's, let's make a comment on this and, and go back. And I was racking my brain before the, the, the call today. I was like, what was the actual, like, how did I fix that? And I, I couldn't, <laughs> just could not recall. I'm a little sleep deprived this week. I just couldn't recall what I had done. But my point is that I'm trying to make poorly at this point was, I think to your point earlier on, if it was a, just an, like a permissions issue, you didn't either you running the CloudFormation template or the entity right. that you're having run the template doesn't have the permissions to create an EC2 instance, it's it's at least going to tell you this is the API call that it made and you got access yeah. denied. In my case, I'm going to go back in Git and I'm going to find what I did wrong in the, in the previous versions to try to re recall. But in my case, it was neat, but it didn't end up helping me solve anything. Um, mm. But I... Probably you're still hooped for KMS things, security related problems. This was right? like a, I'm pretty sure I copied it down somewhere, but it was like one of those really helpful extraneous name parameter value is not allowed. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so my immediate reaction was, oh, you've got a, a tabbing issue like in the YAML file, right? I mm. cut and pasted something or whatever, and it just went oop over a tab. So I went through and checked all the tabs. I'm like, nope. Um, I can't remember like how I fixed it now. Or something. Yeah, like just, you know, how you can kind of like get... Decks, yeah, yeah. But I couldn't find it. I don't remember how I fixed it, but I can tell you that the mm. detect root cause, use go to CloudTrail and look at it, feels kind of gimmicky to me, but I don't know. Maybe at some point I'll find uh, some real value from it, but my first sort of pass on it was meh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea of it. And I think to the point, like yeah. if, it's, if it's just a straight permissions issue, there's probably a lot of value there because it's going to tell you exactly what went wrong because CloudTrail is going to record that. Or maybe I'm missing the mark again here, which hmm. which wouldn't surprise me if I'm just misunderstanding sort of the intent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of sounds like it might be, that might actually have been some kind of template formatting issue instead right not necessarily a cloud trail a thing yeah would have helped you with. yeah and in those kinds of cases at least in my experience most times when cloud formation is not happy mm. uh for me it's either a typo in the template so if you've ever watched yeah. any of the streams you know how often i misspell something so it's a it's a misspelling on a on a attribute name or a property definition or something like that um or it's like a tabbing issue and in those situations right. cloud trail's not going to tell you anything won't right? do anything yeah no. it won't do anything for you no but it was kind of neat that i could just click through it and see all the api calls that were made on my behalf through the, the cloud yeah. formation so kind of neat and I wonder, is it still attached after the stack's deleted? Like, I know you can go back and look at your deleted stacks, right? So I wonder if you could still go in and check that after a while, if it would point to the same location in the oh, logs. Oh, yeah, I don't know. The other thing is, checking. it'd be interesting if maybe you don't delete the stack, but you mm. fix your problem and you do an update and it runs clean. Uh, yeah. You would be able to go back in the event history for a certain amount of time and still see that root cause issue that you had before. I wonder if... You know, a day later, let's say it's still there. I wonder if you could click it and go back to CloudFormation and find it. I don't know. Yeah, I I like the idea, or said CloudFormation, I meant CloudTrail. I like the idea of it being able to just sort of z zero in for you in CloudTrail because we talked about it last week or the week before, right? About yeah. the, some of the challenges of looking for things in CloudTrail um, yeah. through the console. Searches. Yeah, searches. Not intuitive specifically. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of neat. 
Okay, perfect. So those are all the AWS updates that I gathered up from the previous week that I thought all were right. interesting. Uh, let's change gears and talk a little bit about some Gen AI news. So this is the first okay. article that I came across. And this is kind of a theme that you and I have talked about quite often is the fact that uh, smaller organizations using Gen AI tools to kind of level the playing field here uh, against larger organizations. So uh, oh, this sure. article, yeah, this article just kind of gives uh, a couple examples on, you know, uh, businesses that were having a problem and then sort of how they fixed that issue using Gen AI tools. Mm. Um, a couple comments that I, I wrote down here is first, the first example, I guess it all depends what you define as a small and medium sized <laughs> business. Like the first example is a 45 right. uh, employee business. I don't know. In in the Canadian market, would you consider that a small and medium sized business? I, I don't know. Uh, so it struck me that yeah. that was awfully large. It's a little subjective, right? To where you're operating. Yeah. Um, what would that be in Amazon's terms? That would be like, that would be a small business. They probably right. call it a startup. Yeah, they, they probably do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it would be on the smaller end, I think, if, if yes. I remember sort of what how their definitions work. The, the other thing that kind of jumped out at me, I think two of the three examples they gave you. So basically what they, they did was they have three different uh, companies. And they would say, here's the company or here's the problem the company faced. Here's how they fixed it. So in two of the right. three examples they have in the article, they clearly call out that the customers used or the, the employees, whatever they are, use ChatGPT to fix the problem. And in general, the theme was the same. They typically used mm. the Gen AI tool to help them brainstorm, get ideas on maybe how to, how to solve a challenge that they were having. And then right. sort of use that as a starting point to maybe then uh, we talked about sort of this idea of Gen AI CEOs and stuff like that, right? Uh, use yeah. that as sort of a, a brainstorming idea, idea generation tool and then worked with their, their teams internally to kind of uh, extend what they got from the AI tools to kind of go out mm. and, and find solutions. Um, so that was the one thing I noticed. The other thing that I thought was interesting is in one of the examples, the person used ChatGPT again to solve the problem that they had, okay. but then they went back and extended yeah. or created their own custom GPT to help them with something that was time consuming in their own business. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting mm -hmm. on how started one way and then sort of uh, built on top of that on uh, once they realized oh, there was yeah. value there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's kind of, kind of that nebulous um, jagged frontier situation again, right? Like it's hard to know what exactly the efficiency gains you're going to get from these systems, but they're really good at getting you started on a task, maybe pointing you in the right direction. Yeah. So Yeah. I think you, yeah, you hit the nail surprising. on the head with this is it's like pointing you in a direction. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can get a little overwhelmed on the number of things that sort of on your to-do list, or if you get really bogged down troubleshooting, sometimes at least for me, I'm, I'm like, geez, I've, I've done everything I could possibly think of. What now? Right. And I have used right. multiple tools just to say, this is what I'm seeing. Give it a little bit of context. Could you help me solve this? And what I've noticed a couple of times when I've done that is it, whether it's the whether it ends up being the the solution to my problem, it makes me think about it in a way that maybe I hadn't considered myself until I ran out of like, these are the five things I want to try. Now what? It, it gave me some interesting ideas on a direction that I hadn't thought of. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. Sure. Yeah. For the sure. other thing, the other yeah. thing that kind of grabbed my attention on this, uh, it, chat GPT, open AI seems yeah. to be, um, the tool that most people seem to be talking about and and i i, I just yeah, wonder won the uh, the mind share right like yeah the, battle, the early adopter yeah the early adopter yeah yeah absolutely so i i you know it's going to be interesting to see how everybody else i think we had this same conversation where we were talking about gpus and nvidia and stuff right like yeah how does everybody else carve out their little slice of some of this airtime 
because it all seems to be open AI and chat GPT. Yeah, that's yeah. going to be key, right? And I mean, I think Amazon, I mean, like we said, they're going wide. Do they want to provide the platform for you to build on? Um, Google is just trying to integrate it into their search, make it as ubiquitous as they can. So there's a bunch of strategies. Facebook's implementing it in all of their social platforms, their uh, Instagram reels, that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. But I think most people, when they think about Gen AI, and I know this is an overgeneralization, I, I think if you were to do like sort of a back of the napkin survey, you know, brand recognition and stuff like that, I bet you most yeah. people would be able to tell you about OpenAI and ChatGPT. I wonder what the fall off would be <laughs> from from that to the others, right? I bet it would be a family feud, like 80 people said chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. We asked 100 people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the top four answers are on the board. Okay. So that I, this is worth an, a, a read. And I think, I think the, the, the whole, the, the interesting part about this article is how you can use this tool, regardless of the size of the organization, to... Right brainstorm to give you ideas point you in directions that maybe you hadn't thought of i think there's tons of value there yeah it's not something that's easily predictable how much value or what you might get what tasks you might get value on right yeah so yeah yeah and oh, i'm going to skip over this one we're going to come back to that one this one here because we're canadian um uh so anthropic now is uh, is made cloud or claude available in canada which means you can use the uh, Cloud AI web-based version. There's an iOS app. Uh, there's a Cloud API, okay. and then there's uh, a plan that you can purchase now uh, if you're in Canada. Um, gotcha. Yeah, my first reaction with it was was really I okay. I didn't know it wasn't available in Canada, <laughs> but then I thought about it for a second. I'm like, well, wait, dumbass, you've been using Bedrock, so. Uh, I've got access to all these models, so I've never really even considered going out and saying I'll make a purchase of like a subscription <laughs> of, of Claude because I've just been using it anyways in Bedrock. So this caught me a little by surprise. Um, I might subscribe to this. It's 28 bucks Canadian plus tax, which I guess is maybe a li in line with OpenAI and ChatGPT. Um, you get access to all of the models, Opus, Sonnet, and Haiku. Um, and then there's a team plan, which I don't quite understand. There's a an uplift of uh, roughly 17 bucks per user per month on the team plan, and you must have at least five seats. I didn't look at the feature sets and comparison and stuff, so I wonder what, the, what do you get for the extra 17-ish bucks a month to have a team plan? Right. I might subscribe to this and, and I'll explain why here as we go to the other slide uh, just to try it, right? Just to oh, see sure. what it's like, right? Yeah. I mean, I wonder what the difference, I mean, I guess they have, is it is it a dedicated chat app like ChatGPT that give you access so. to you pretty much? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, the okay. only crappy part about what I saw on this, I was like, oh, okay, I've got a, an app on my phone. Uh, I have a Pixel, so... <laughs> no app for me um so right i, I you, you immediately lose some of the value there i i can tell you speaking of open ai and chat gpt uh karen laughs at me like i walk around snapping pictures of everything on my phone now and asking chat oh, yeah. gpt what it is <laughs> <laughs> particularly plants and stuff like that um so having that 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 assistant on your phone I, I can see a lot of value there. Um, I, I, I'm sure they'll introduce it on other platforms, right? It makes sense to have it on. Yeah, other for platforms, sure. But uh, so they'll I just get it to Android eventually. Surely. Oh yeah, yeah, I would think so, right? So I might try this out just to see what it's like, and that's an actually nice segue into this guy. So Anthropic mm. is now introducing uh, agents bots, whatever you want to call them now. Okay. Um, and that's sort of tied to the other thing here where they said, I thought they had, maybe I'm getting confused with another, another um, reference or note, but I kind of thought somewhere I had read about those agents or bots being available. So this is again, nothing new here, 
but uh, you're now able to create assistance using anthropic models with Claude. And you can actually access these models or these this functionality directly through Anthropics API, through Bedrock, mm -hmm. and through okay. Google. Um, so okay. I thought that might be interesting. We could we could try it out and see how it works. For sure, yeah. This is definitely more compelling. I mean, the agents are going to be the next thing, right? So if you can use them easier or better on Anthropics platform, then that's a win for them. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, we keep saying uh, agents are going to be the the next thing. Agents are going to be the next thing, and I see lots of right. really interesting YouTube videos about it. And look at I, I have these agents doing all this work for me. Um, I'm still having a hard time with the value prop of some of this stuff. Like, yeah, you know. But I, I guess more options is always good. I, I think the challenge here is. Do you get so bogged down into building this stuff you're not doing the important stuff? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's tough. It kind of. It almost feels like. Uh, I mean, we've been through a lot of hype cycles recently with uh, technology in general, right? And yeah. uh, people are very excited about AI at the moment. So something to keep yeah. in mind. Something to keep in mind. Yeah. Make sure that you 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 have a good use case for it before you invest a whole right. ton of time and effort and, <laughs> and dollars uh, and then kind of come out the other side and go, wait a second, you know, what's the value of, of this thing? I don't know. Right. Oh, did you see this too? I know it's not in my list, but uh, the AI pin, remember the AI pin, I think uh, humane. Oh yeah. <laughs> I saw this and, and I should have, there, there's something wrong with the charging case. It can like light on fire okay. or something. So they basically <laughs> told you to stop. <laughs> I kind of at some don't point I, yeah, don't wear it, don't charge it. You have a you have a brick now. I I kind of wow. I there's almost a point where I I get to a point where I I kind of feel bad because this is a great example of the hype cycle, right? Like I remember when this came out, yeah. everyone was like, "Oh my god, oh my god, you can wear it on your shirt," and you know it tells all this does everything for you, and it just seems to be you know uh, getting s smacked one time after another after another ever yeah. since they made that first video and everybody was like this is cool and then it's just been shit news after shit news ever since it feels like with particularly with yeah. that device right so yeah well the, the, that's not the only device that's had issues right do you know do you remember the rabbit MQ? the rabbit yeah 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 what's it happened to that to is it pretty much is it pretty much dead at this point Pretty much, it, yeah. it turns out it they they overpromised and uh, underdelivered and uh, to an extreme degree. So, like, it's not even it, it's just a it's a underpowered phone basically that runs an app, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's about it. Yeah, I guess this is this is are we in the the hype cycle right now where there's just a lot of stuff that's going around that's. Profiteering, I don't know if is the is the right word to use, but just uh, making making gains because um, hmm. this is so popular right now, and everybody wants to try the new thing. Uh, I wonder how long it'll take to kind of get all of that stuff dealt with, and then sort of more serious outcomes here with with right. Gen AI. I don't know. I think it'll stay. Well, I mean, we're already seeing huge progress in a lot of research areas right and that's where i've been most excited to see yeah so uh, there's a couple of articles we have today about that as well so yeah okay so let's move on we'll get to those uh i thought this was interesting so um this has been making the rounds on the socials this week um <laughs> and i just thought i'd include it so basically the story that i've heard and and again it's only yeah. been little slices of of things that people are are posting on social media and stuff but it, it basically was like uh no I, I i didn't do that but yeah these chips are going over here so basically the story is that there were a whole bunch of gpus meant for tesla okay. that yep. were redirected to x for x's ai uh tools so okay in one in one whatever they call it now, I'll just call it a post. No, I, I didn't say that. And then the second one was, yeah, I, that this is why we're doing it. So kind of weird. It's It's been all over the technology news this week, but it's 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 no small number. I think in the article, there's a mandate. So the mandate is that uh, 
by the end of the year, uh, Musk wants 100,000 H100 GPUs available to X. Wow. Uh, Okay. making it sort of one of the largest clusters of GPUs in the world. And the gist of this article was that there were 12,000 GPUs heading to Tesla that were redirected uh, over to X. Um, I don't, you know, again, I think a lot of this is, is, uh, oops, we lost Travis. One second. You back? Oh, I don't have audio now. Hang on a second. What happened? I have two of you in the... We're having a little technical issue here. We'll be... Uh, just give us a sec. We'll see if Travers rejoins. There you go. <laughs> okay. I had two of you. I had one of you and then one of you in the green room and I could hear neither of you. Um, I was just saying <laughs> that uh, I think a lot of this just is is clickbait and, you know, oh my God, look at this horrible stuff that's happening. Um, it's, it's no small number, obviously. It says here in the article that the value of those uh, H100s, 12,000 of them, is about half a billion dollars. It's so, so. Like very expensive <laughs> GPUs. Yeah. Is that, is that right? Does it say they were just sitting around in a warehouse? Well, that's the, the, oh, the comment. The, the okay. comment was, yeah, if, if I didn't move them over here, they would have just sat in a warehouse because we, we didn't have the ability to use them, I guess, at this point. I don't know. You'll never really know the truth of this. But just right. because it was making the rounds, I, I thought, and <laughs> and and we like to talk about uh, uh, the chip wars and stuff. So I guess right. they're fighting internally for chips now too, even, it sounds like. <laughs> so there we go. Within the Muscovers. Yes. Yeah, I like Struggle. it. So let's get on to the cooler stuff that's uh, less social media clickbait. Uh, walk us through right. these these interesting sort of research oriented articles that you found here. First one is about yeah. uh, weather forecasting. Yeah, so using generative AI to quantify uncertainty in weather forecasting, it's a Google research paper. Uh, they're calling the technology Seeds, and they're using it to accelerate and improve weather forecasts with diffusion models. So the thing with forecasting weather, the state of the art before this was it's extremely computationally expensive to run the models, uh, which means it's extremely financially expensive, right? Uh, it takes time and, and energy to run those predictions. But it turns out that what you can do is you can leverage the corpus of weather data, of historical weather data, and use the diffusion element of generative AI. So kind of that you start with a, a patch of noise and you condense it down into something that's useful, right? Mm -hmm. Which is how most large language models work and uh, image generations work, right? Um, so what you can do is you can actually create a prediction model that is slightly more efficient than the state of the art and way less expensive to run because you just have to train it on these uh, on this historical data instead of this generated um, computationally intensive uh, model data for weather prediction. So yeah. I think they made this; they're making these services uh, available. So you generally. can you can like. When you say available, is this something I can, I can do my own weather predictions? I, I wonder. I, I, I'd be interested to see. Uh, I know that the flood forecasting is, which is the next paper. Yeah. Uh, spoiler. But, yeah. Uh, spoiler, yeah. Yeah, C's leverage is the power of Gen AI to produce ensemble forecasts comparable to those from the operational U.S. forecast system, but at an accelerated pace. So the results they reported, they need only two seeding forecasts from the operational system to get 31 forecasts in the current version to give you an idea of like the scale and uh, efficiency wow. gains you get by doing this. So you can use you know, a lot less of that computationally intense data. So just to potentially is... rain on this a little bit, you see what I did there? Yeah. How, how nice. <laughs> yeah. How, like, I would hate to be a person that is... Uh, charged right now with predicting weather i think it's probably got to be one of the most thankless jobs like i don't know how many times today my echo has said it's gonna rain 
<laughs> and then it doesn't rain. And right. like, again, I'm seeing here, it's been telling me it's going to rain on and off all day. Now it's telling me it's not, not until 6 PM. I, I wonder, like, I'd be interested. Does this, those 31 forecasts that it can, can generate out of the two seed forecasts, mm. uh, I'd be interested to know kind of in the end, you know, how many of those, those generated forecasts were of, I don't want to say of like value. I think they're all really. value, but how accurate are they? Right. Cause it's gotta be yeah, really, yeah. really tough with climate change and stuff nowadays to even remotely predict what is going to happen in the next two hours, let alone, what'd you say? 10 days, I think. Um, right. Well, you know what that's I mean? the, the weather is an extremely hard problem for that reason, because the system is so chaotic, right? You have to deal yeah. with, I mean, you're dealing with the atmosphere, there's air currents, heat change, temperature changes, humidity changes, everything. All yeah. of that entails. So, but it seems like here they, I mean, we're looking at the results section and they're claiming it's more accurate than the traditional method. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, the, the technology itself, to your point, like it's just before this computationally intensive, very expensive to do. If they're able to reduce the time it takes to do these things and, and yeah. reduce the cost, then obviously there's lots and lots of benefits in able being able to generate these different potentials in in rapid succession at a very low cost, right? So lots yeah. of value here, I'm sure. Because essentially what they're doing is they're extrapolating potential future weather states from the computationally intense simulation data. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So I'm going to skip over... No, I'm not. I'm going to go to the flood forecasting one. Walk us through the okay. flood forecast. So the flood forecasting is interesting because it's using, again, I guess it kind of has to do with weather and rainfall, but rainfall is hard to predict in the short term, right? Or short term and long term. Mm -hmm. So what they've done is they're making this available. They're using local uh, data from uh, maps, pictures, essentially and making it available to predict kind of what areas might be at risk for flooding when you so say you maps can, are you talking about like google maps or basically yeah, like taking google, satellite. That satellite data and, and feeding it in yeah essentially you take satellite data uh let's see you take a uh, model identifies where the river is expected to flood by processing publicly available data sources so it also takes in precipitation weather basin data and it puts out a forecast of uh river level basically to predict whether you might have a experience a flood in that area. And again, using historical data to kind of train models wow. to predict that. You know, this goes uh, back to kind of like what you mentioned earlier on, like the real value of this stuff, Gen AI, is all about providing people with access to this type of information. Like arguing oh, yeah. about where GPUs go and stuff makes for great social <laughs> media posts, but it does. this is where like the true value of this, like think about, like it says here, flood hub currently covers river basins in 80 countries, providing critical flood forecasting for over 1800 sites and population of 460 million people. Yeah. And in like, a lot of cases, it's better predictions than you get from the local data. So. Yeah. Like there, that's like, these are our use cases that you can, you can see true value kind of like along hmm. the medical research that we've talked about and stuff like that, yeah. providing these, this type of information and tools to make people's lives better. Uh, this, this stuff's pretty incredible when you think about it. Yeah. Like I saw another paper that was about predicting um, the effects of contrails because planes will leave trails essentially of exhaust that can have a detrimental impact, a warming effect for a long time after they pass through. Mm -hmm. And apparently the, the, thesis of the paper was that if you reduce the altitude of the flight by a small margin you get drastically reduced effects it's like 50 percent uh wow. of the warming effect yeah. and it costs about 0.3 percent more fuel efficiency which yeah. is a big deal for airlines yeah but it you know is that a cost you're willing to spend i guess is the question yeah, yeah. also you see these things used to predict forest fires like uh, using satellite data and temperature data to predict natural disasters essentially i yeah. think is another really important use yeah. case going to be going to be super valuable especially again to well, comment yeah. made earlier on just as the climate continues to change right being able to forecast this give people some level of of heads up warning uh, you know before yeah. something really goes sideways uh, cuz i guess 
you know, we're going to see more and more unusual weather events. So being able to give somebody yeah, a, a bit of heads up time uh, is, is, is super valuable. Uh, really cool. And then we've got the last one here is. Oh, yeah. So this is kind of interesting. Again, I, I picked a theme here, but mm -hmm. uh, this was like NVIDIA posting. They did a lot of uh, updates. Um, Jensen one was saying that he wanted the company to essentially be run by AI eventually. Yeah. Yep. Um, so they're moving heavily into kind of the simulation training uh, space for robotics, but also they released this model that was like extremely hyper localized weather prediction. Yeah. So like in your city block kind of situation. Wow. Like down to that level. Wow. I don't know it, if the video. Yeah. Want me to jump ahead a little bit? Sure. Let's see if we can find it's kind of zooming in here. I don't know if it do you pick up my yeah, we my system audio? I don't think you do. I'll <laughs> no, make sure that no I, audio coming through for yeah, me, but... I think I could fiddle around with it, but I'll just muck up all the audio and we'll be in worse shape <laughs> than here, we are. Through it. Yeah. They're like global forecast, there's a twenty five kilometer resolution. Core diff, there's like a two kilometer resolution. Wow. For weather data. So yeah, you're you're talking about like like you said, like city block type stuff. Yeah. Well, more like, I guess, like city said sections. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool, eh? Again, yeah, this is really where the real value of these these models and being able to do these types of predictions, I think, would would continue to, to improve the quality, uh, quality of life for a lot of people. Right. Like, what's yeah. the weather expected to be at your workplace tomorrow, right? <laughs> so is it going to rain at, yeah. the, at, the, at your office? Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> but like, look, they're looking at micro effects uh microclimate effects from airflow, airflow. on skyscrapers here yeah there's a so you know just on on that there's a really good i'll see if i can find it you know to toronto city hall new city hall the oh, yeah. one that's the wrapped building right it's kind of the very interesting a, structure yeah. yeah and i remember way back in my university days we they did like a whole presentation on and you can imagine this was a while ago, but just again, the effects of the shape of that building on yeah. airflow around the building for like other residents and mm. people going about their day to day lives, you know, moving past those spaces. Uh, I don't recall the the details of it now, but I remember they had done a lot of modeling like what they had shown there obviously not like they do nowadays but that whole idea of just being able to understand the, the weather patterns the air patterns wind patterns right. around that building uh, they spent a lot of time doing that because they weren't quite sure what the effects of building placing a building like that uh, would be on on the surroundings it was kind of neat <laughs> so it's neat to see that in that video there where you're seeing the the airflow the air currents around those tall buildings kind of neat well, sure, because it could have a big effect on local weather. It's uh, the air through, flow through the neighborhood, right? Yeah. Gets yeah. massively impacted. Yeah, very good. I did, just to switch back from the, the true usefulness of this, uh, I hmm. forgot to add a link when I was clicking through and setting up the browser. There was a oh, link. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about OpenAI, and you know, is it called Sora? Is it Sora, the yeah. text-to-video thing? There was, yeah. I think it's this week at a film fest, maybe in Europe? where mm. they are uh, sort of premiering 15-minute movies that are completely made by AI. So OpenAI is, is I think, co-sponsoring some of it or something like that. So there's, again, an example oh, sure. of how they're making sure they're staying ahead of, of everybody else in, in the news cycle. So that'll be interesting to see what happens there. But then I stumbled across an article that was a, uh, from Ashton Kusher, Sure, I think is how you say oh, his yeah. name, right? And he was mentioning about how he thinks in very short order, most movies will be Gen AI. And his comment was something along the lines of like, if I needed to take a shot of a house, like in for a movie, why would I want to do that in real life? Because it's going to cost like tens of thousands of dollars to go out on, on set and do all that. And I could instead just use describe text to build that out. And it would cost me a hundred bucks and I don't need anything um like studios well, sure. or anything like that and then the other comment was and i can't remember who the person was in the article but they had basically said they had postponed plans to open a studio or ex yeah. that's it yeah thank you or ex expand an existing studio because their thought was holy crap this is going to change a lot of stuff and maybe we don't need oh, yeah. all of this stuff um i'll make sure to include that one in the show notes i lost it somewhere here 
while we were cutting, while I was cutting and pasting stuff over. But I just thought it was really interesting to see how uh, people in the industries are starting to think about how this stuff is really going to affect what their day to day work oh, yeah. looks like. Right. So this is going to be a, totally crazy for the film industry. And for, oh, because, yeah. Yeah. Massive disruption, possibly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's everything. Um, let's see. Oh, housekeeping. Mm. I'm 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 playing a little catch up this month. We are going to do another webinar, uh, probably last Thursday of the month. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm just going to recycle the Gen a intro intro to Gen AI one that we just did, or come up with a, a something new to run through this month. The intro to Gen AI is up on our website now, so you can have a look at that. I'll make sure that I include the show notes to it, uh, so you can you can check that one out. So that was the only housekeeping item I had. Did you have anything? Uh, nope, no housekeeping for okay. me. Um, right. I did watch Godzilla minus one, and I highly recommend it. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw it, and I I read a review or two about it, and people were saying it was it was a good movie. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I have a couple for you. I have one good one and one meh one. So the first okay. is a movie called Yummy, and I'm pretty yummy. sure Yummy. We found it on. Um, I'm pretty sure it was on Shutter. So if you subscribe okay. to Shutter, you can, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's where it is. Essentially, it's a zombie movie. And okay. it, it's kind of like it's a it's a form film of some sort. Uh, I don't know country of origin, but basically they go to like a plastic surgery clinic to have some work done. <laughs> and okay. unknown to them in the basement, they are doing experimentation <laughs> uh, to help uh, you okay. know, to sort of keep people from aging and let's just, I'll leave it as, you know, it doesn't go like planned. And it's kind of like, um, it's one of those kind of comedy horror genre. Karen and I both okay. had a couple good chuckles through the movie. So it's, it's worth a watch. And my second one is Dune 2. Yeah. Did you, did you watch the second Dune? We watched it, and we watched it in uh, what's the name of the seats that move? Five uh, oh, D or whatever. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, all I say is that you you haven't watched Dune two until you've watched your friend try to take a, a drink from his uh, his soda when Paul Atreides is riding the worm, <laughs> and he's going like, <laughs> "That's fantastic." What did you think of the movie in general? I liked it. I you liked, liked it. it? That was good. Yeah, our our general reaction was meh, three hours. Yeah. Okay, I, I it's long. I have a hard time watching a ninety minute movie, let alone mm. a hundred and eighty minute movie. So we actually sliced it in two. Um, okay, I just I couldn't sit and watch it all. I just I don't have the ability to to do that. I just can't. Um, I don't know. I. I don't know. I, I think there was a lot of the cinematography was fantastic. The CGI was fantastic. Oh, yeah. I think they could have probably made that in an hour and a half movie without all the like wide sweeping views of things. Um, maybe if I saw it in a, in a chair that was shaking as I was t trying to drink a pop or uh, <laughs> maybe on IMAX or something like that. Like a friend of ours saw it uh, on an IMAX screen and she said it was absolutely fantastic i just it was I awesome just, and I, I just streamed yeah. it so um i thought it was pretty good but uh the cgi in it the ships and stuff like that uh oh so good pretty yeah. fantastic so i don't know i just i have a hard time stomaching a three-hour movie i just i just can't make myself do it so it's a lot yeah i think i might read the books though i read the books when i was like a teenager mm -hmm. i might go back and reread them Classic. um yeah just uh just to kind of go through the story in maybe more detail than what you can get in the, on the big screen, right. Or on the medium yep. sized screen for us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that is the show okay. for another week and uh, we'll be back next Thursday uh, at the same time, about 2 PM Eastern uh, barring any sort of technical difficulties <laughs> or uh, multitasking on my part that makes us start late, but uh, we'll be back yep. next week with all the latest news. So until then, uh, bye.